Thank you very much indeed, Jackie, for a provocative, in fact, we've had two provocative presentations. We now have an opportunity for discussion, but let me drag Alistair down, if I can do it. He's a, our project leader. Um, a few questions, if there are any, from our audience here. Uh, then we have an opportunity, if there are questions from our uh, online audience as well. We've been challenged. Are there any initial questions? If there are, please keep them short and focused. Nick as well. Where is Nick? He's in the audience. Come, come down, Nick. <laughs> are there any initial questions from our audience here? We should have. We've been challenging and provocative. Can you please speak carefully? Ah, uh, oh, we have a microphone, which is even better. Uh, Pam, you, you said you ran into various issues with the planning side. Pam. <laughs> You said you ran into various issues with the planning side. What, what sort of issues did you actually run into? Well, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm not renowned for being quiet. Uh, the sorts of issues that we came across was the lack of recognition that in, in planning terms um, you might be able to identify recreational space but you couldn't identify food growing space other than an antiquated allotment policy. The sorts of things that we uh, came up against, but you know, I believe in taking these things head on, is in the South Pennines, increasingly as in other parts of the world, sustainable tourism as an economic driver is really important. People come in walking, enjoying themselves riding, whatever else it might be, eating local food. Local food needs to be produced. We aren't in the, you know, Vale of Isham, as I said before, and most local food would have to be produced under polytunnels. Where are you going to put the polytunnels if you're not going to end up looking like Almeria or somewhere? So there is a conversation there to be had. And I would say that planners are absolutely key to come forward to try and help us work out where you can get that balanced approach between local food production and a fabulous tourism experience because of what's special about that particular landscape. So for me, the challenges around planning is getting planners really behind the sense of place and getting them feeling that within the frameworks within, the, the, within which they operate, that can, they can be more creative in capturing what is special about the environment, but also allowing for the economic opportunities to flow. So it's kind of like getting people to think outside their box. That's been the only problem that we've had, because to be quite honest, we've just not asked. That's good. You just just got something you just very quickly on that point, I mean, uh, dealing with planners, I think one of the issues you have to understand is that they, they are practicing, if you like, a legal process through the statutory development plans, and that zoning fixation can sometimes restrict that opportunity. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities for experimentation, and there are tools like Section 106 planning agreements, or for our Scottish colleagues, the Section 75, um, and that could actually involve more innovative uses, and I think that's something that planners need to experiment more and, and they need to be able and given the space to do that without fear of judicial review mm -hmm. and all the legal sanctions that they're, they're always looking over their shoulders. So I think people want to understand the difficult position that planners sometimes yeah. are in. Absolutely. Planners are always in a difficult position, usually squashed in the middle. Uh, do we have any other queries from the floor here? Please. Uh, we've had two very contrasting um, presentations. One, a very much uh, bottom-up approach. The other one, top-down. Um, which is the most important, and there's a precondition for answering, and we're not allowed to say both. <laughs> Can I ask Jackie first? <coughs> go, go mad, say go. But it is both. You can't have one without the other. <laughs> You can't, and, and I mean, I think I think the challenge that we've got, um, I think that, and, and the reason I say it's both is because I think part of the challenge with, with with doing the rippling out from the Olympic Park that I, I was talking about is because there isn't necessarily an understanding um, in the host boroughs about how important having that access 
um, outdoors and out into the natural environment or, or, or into you know, food growing and so on, as Pam's been talking about, is because they haven't necessarily had that experience. So you almost have to work with people at the bottom up in order to create um, the space and the understanding of why you need some bigger strategy in order to deliver it across a wider area at a landscape scale. So I think you have to have both. You've got to do hearts and minds winning, and that's bottom up work. Yeah, and that's exactly what Pam's been doing. Do you have an academic's perspective on that? Do I? No, Nick. No, Nick. <laughs> Um, I, I quite agree with that analogy. I think it's uh, the, the connection of the two is where the um, most interesting space often happens. And we're talking about opportunity spaces today, yes. but the middle is the most interesting. And there's some, some very, um, we look around here in, in East Side, there's some very good local initiatives, but there's also the incoming imposition of HS2 at the top, literally, in, uh, to some extent, of some of those initiatives. And it'll be fascinating special to see what happens in, in the top meeting the bottom. I can see Pam that you're jotting notes. So yeah, I, well, <laughs> can, I, can I just say something about it? It's been really challenging. You can imagine that I have, uh, working in a forestry sector, I really, really mean that it's been really challenging. But I think there's huge opportunities at the moment for the brave, and I think the work that you're actually doing here um, couldn't be more exciting. It was really interesting you going back to the commission and the countryside age. <laughs> it's a good old days that we remember talking about stuff like that, and I know there are friends in the room for, that would reflect back on those. But at a time when we're being challenged about the economy, and yet, you know, this little devil on the shoulders of those people that are driving that agenda forward keeps saying, you know, climate change, sustainability. There is a huge opportunity for a really proactive, pushing agenda that says you can do the win-win-win and this is how it's done. And how it's done, lots of the things that we're doing and that the Countryside Agency did and the Forestry Commission did and the National England and academics are demonstrating that you can actually create economic opportunity that creates public investment and invests in the natural resources that we've got. It isn't impossible to do that. And this is a real moment for us to grab that agenda much more proactively. Stop just talking about it and start pulling together and finding the platforms on which you can challenge policymakers to do that win-win-win. In fairness? <laughs> Well, it's actually strange that I have uh, was responsible for the agriculture in both Todman and area and in the Lee Valley oh, at different okay. times in my lifetime. <laughs> and I appreciate the problems you've had in both areas because neither are an easy <laughs> area to uh, farm in or to have horticulture in. But both are, uh, well, certainly the Lee Valley is, is well known for its horticulture. Um, I think the answer to the question is, is quite simple that you need top down assistance and help to deliver anything because they've got to clear the way. Um, but without the bottom up um, help, then you can't afford to do it. Because if, the, if you've got to pay for everything from the top and get professionalism to do it, you need the amateur input into that and the people in the, in the local areas to actually buy into it. Otherwise, it won't survive. And, and if it isn't sustainable, it isn't worth doing. I think the answer is they're inextricably entwined, and perhaps they should be. Uh, let me try an experiment. Uh, Rachel, do we have any online questions? <laughs> You'll have to ask them. <laughs> 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 Hello, can you hear me again there? Yes, yeah. that's right. We have two questions coming through the online streaming uh, one from New York and one from the Netherlands. Really? So, the one from New York um, has a question for Pam. It's from Michael Hardman. It would be. And if possible, you evidently feel that Incredible Edible's innovative use of land in and around your town should be replicated in other areas. Do you feel other local authorities would be as welcoming as Todd Modern? Uh, they've got to be. Yes, I do. And I think there's some fabulous stuff that's going on in New York and all over the place. And I was particularly <coughs> taken with some um, leadership from the authorities in Seattle who were creating an edible public park. And I just think that's music to my ears. It's taken three years for us to get the local authority to say it's incredible edible Calderdale and to create this vision of an asset register and the mainstreaming of public servants to support the community in the learning around horticultural skills and the like. So we're bending public funding. But for any local authority, certainly in this country, 
desperately seeking a new way forward with less funds to create that sort of enabling framework. It's a God's gift. So yeah, I think a lot of authorities are already doing that. And if we could create a worldwide network of those and show that best practice, that would encourage the ones that are perhaps a little more reticent to get their act together. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mike, from the uh, annual conference of the Association of American Geographers. Uh, next question. Thank you, Peter. The second question is from the Netherlands, and it's also to Pam. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what would you recommend to others who would like to start such a project? In particular, what do you see as the most important bottlenecks that could happen and would need to be overcome? The only thing you need is the will to do it. That's all you need. So, um, our experience has been wherever we have been, and we've spoken in the Netherlands, we've spoken in Copenhagen, we've spoken in Spain, we've been all over the place. A positive agenda around food just gets people thinking, where can I start? So the only thing that you have to get over is the mindset that says, somebody's got to give me the permission, or the check, or I've got to have a policy document. You don't, you just need to start. And then you get a sense of ownership of your own space. And at the point at which you've used up all your own resources, so you've not gone to the begging bowl with the begging bowl to start with, that's when you start to talk to the people in the policy field who, quite honestly, in my experience, are nothing but helpful, given that they have seen that you're trying to give them something they can say yes to, as opposed to something they have to say, I can't afford to do that. <coughs> And there's loads of great work going on in the Netherlands around the, the, the Green Heart, around uh, the Hague and so on. Um, and I, so, so I would just say be brave. There's nothing stopping you at all if you've got the will to do it. There is an absolute huge historic opportunity for the people, the power around the people to take over their own spaces in a way that I've never seen in the last 30 years of being in the public sector. Thank you. 